Welcome, everyone. It's a great turnout today. Thank you so much for coming. Our guest today is an internationally acclaimed photographer and multimedia journalist whose commercial and personal work has shown a deep and consistent commitment to telling stories of real people, human rights, cultural diversity, and global equality. Some of her clients include the Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation, International YWCA, the New York Times Entrepreneur, the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company and Business Week. She's photographed projects for Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, and Costco. She's working with the NYU Department of Public Health, creating multimedia content for software to aid um, HIV AIDS patients in Kenya. She's the founder of Salam Garage, an organization that I'll have her tell you more about today. She's also published a book entitled, Can I Come With You? Uh, which talks about some of the projects she's been involved with. So please join me in welcoming Amanda Coster. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Coster, and I'm going to talk to you today not about my commercial career, not about a lot of the stuff that you just said, Jenny, but <laughs> talk about something else. Uh, how many of you are, so I'm going to try and talk for like half an hour or so because I really want to have time for questions and answers because half the time I'm speaking about something and y'all are thinking about something else. So I want to make sure that whatever it is that you're thinking about, we get a chance to talk about that too. So I'm just, as a show of hands, like how many of you are studying photography or multimedia or something like that right now? Raise your hand high. Now these half raises, okay. I'm really blunt, by the way. I'm from the East Coast, and so I apologize in advance, all right? <laughs> but um, so that looks like about 75% of you, and, and then the rest of you that didn't raise your hands, you're just here just for the heck of it, right? <laughs> art interior design. Cool, thank you. Um, who's, raise your hand if you're doing the interior design, if you're part of that group. Nice. Nice. Welcome. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, that's really helpful. So usually what happens right now is I, I wish I had a completely different talk to, to prepare for you because all these new ideas come to my mind, but I'm going to stick with what I have. So today I'm going to talk about, in a way, no more drive-bys. Um, and that's a term most of you think of drive-by shootings as like me driving by in a car and shooting you and killing you and driving away and you're left to die, right? That's, what I, that's my idea of a drive-by shooting in the, where I went to school back in New Haven. We had drive-by shootings on the campus all the time. So that's what a drive-by was when I was about your age. But then I started studying photography and I realized there's a new kind of drive-by shooting that most photographers and myself are guilty of and that's showing up and shooting somebody, driving away and leaving them with their heart and soul wide open and never even getting to know their name. To me, that's also a drive-by shooting. And we're all guilty of it. I've done it tons of times, and I'm going to show you my best drive-by shooting ever in this presentation. But, you know, if, if, I can, if, I can, if I can leave you with one thing, if, like, now you just pick up your phone and start tweeting saying this lady's nuts, like, just remember that those are really drive-by shootings, and you really do have a lasting impact on people when you take their picture and jet. You really do. I've lived it, I've experienced it, I've been doing this for about 25 years, and I've experienced people tell me what it felt like when we took their picture and left, never even got to know their name, okay? So hopefully you, you'll, you'll not do that so often anymore. So, no more drive-bys. Oh, hold on. Okay, it's not going to work. Maybe it is. So, um... Why, I, Ginny asked me a little bit, is it okay if I call you Ginny in front of everybody? You're not Mrs., okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what people do in school anymore. When I went to school, it was Professor so-and-so, so, but again, that's the East Coast. But anyway, so before I discovered photography, I wrote like a maniac. Has anyone ever heard of the word, or the book called Harriet the Spy? Who has heard of that? Wow, okay, so it's like half the room, okay. So 
before I, I'm not one of those people who like worked on the high school, high school yearbook. I wasn't like an art, into art or anything in high school. I can't, I'm not one of those people that said, I knew I was going to be a photographer, you know, since I was five. I, I didn't. Okay, I just stumbled into photography. I'm going to tell you how. But I read, um, when I was young, I read Harriet the Spy, and I had kind of a super screwed up childhood. So what I ended up doing was writing a lot and not talking to a lot of people. I was really shy. I didn't really open up to people. I read that book. And I just, and so like Harriet the Spy, I would bought uh, <laughs> these like black and white composition books and just wrote all the time. I didn't really talk much to anybody because I was dealing with like a war zone that was going on in my house when I went home until I left home. So anyway, I wrote and wrote and wrote and never picked up a camera. I never did any of that. Not that person and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And so these are all my journals that I've just started showing and sharing. Some of them are in my book now. Um, for a long time. So a lot of people when I was, ki was a kid, when I was dealing with my childhood, would ask me, like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you talking? And I felt like they just wanted me to answer their questions and fill in their blanks, but they never really wanted to know what was going on in my mind. And so that was that. And when I was 14 years old, I left home and lived with a foster mom. I was lucky enough to sit. I'm really lucky. I was really lucky to save enough for college, live with a foster mom, go to school, and I ended up studying anthropology. And when I studied anthropology, and still I'm writing like Matt, like a crazy person, and then when I was studying anthropology, I thought, well, how the heck am I going to get a job? You know, so I looked around a room just like this, and I thought, well, everybody here is studying anthropology 101, and at some point we're all going to be in line for the same job. How am I going to get that job? You know, we all have the same level of education. So I thought photography would be really useful for that. So I took a photography class. I didn't like the photography class at my university because, I go on a limb when I say this at, at schools, but I, I just felt like they were teaching me how to, like, be a fine art photographer, but not how to really apply it. Like, I didn't really learn what was going on in the photo field. I just felt like I was learning about whatever that photography teacher learned about in school, which was really outdated information. So, and this is pre-digital and it's still outdated information, right? So I didn't like that program at all and I left it. I just felt like, I called it sort of armchair photographers. I was like, that's really great, but what do you, like, what's the last photo project you ever did, teacher? And he's like, oh, I haven't really done anything. I'm like, well, I want to do something. And, this isn't working for me. So I went to a different school, and then I met Harold Shapiro. Harold Shapiro was the most, was and is one of the most amazing photo teachers and influences ever on my life. Um, what I love about Harold Shapiro is that he's, he's no big deal, right? Like, I went to a university, Southern Connecticut State University, and studied anthropology. It's a no big deal school, okay? No one's ever heard of it. Actually, You'll never hear of it because Yale's down the street. So like Yale, you can't, you know, when you have Yale down the street, like nothing else pretty much exists. So we didn't really exist, but the only news we ever got were like those drive-by shootings, right, that were going on because our school was next to the projects. But we luckily called it Yale on sale because all of our professors <laughs> that were getting their PhD had to do student teaching, so they went to our school and taught us. So by the time I got, we got up to, you know, upper level classes, we, we realized why it was called Yale on sale. It was really on sale because it was darn cheap. I don't even want to tell you guys how much school it was back then. But anyway, so the school, the point is, is that the school was no big deal, right? And then I went to, then that other photography school I went to where Harold Shapiro was my teacher was also no big deal. It was some, I don't know if we have one here in Seattle. Seattle tends to poof up their schools a little bit. This school was not poofed up, again, because it was like in the shadow of Yale, so there was just absolutely no way to outshine Yale. So this was just some like community art school. Nobody ever heard of it. No big deal. It was like photography and uh, painting and, you know, like paper mache. I don't even know, you know, like just like random basket weaving. And then there was like this photography class, right? And this is what it, this is what it looked like. So this is it today, okay? So in the upper left, there's three computers. 
Like, this is it, this is the school today. The room is exactly the same with, the, I mean, even all that junk behind the monitor, that, or behind the screen, like, that's been there for 25 years or something. This is where I went to school, and it's really, truly no big deal, you know? And, and I stress this because the more public speaking I do and the more, like, big deal events I go to, the more I really need to show people, like, this whole concept of big deal and famous teacher and uh, all these awards, like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference because I'm standing here today with no big deal education on my back. So here's our no big deal. Um, that's the enlarger that I started off on. That's it today. And I think they fixed the gears, but when I started on that enlarger, like, you had to hold it because if you didn't, the thing would knock down, would knock down on my head because everybody stripped the gears and nobody listened to them when they said you have to lock and unlock the thing. And so now that's fixed and they actually, they painted that red. And Harold was all proud of that when he showed me in December. He's like, yeah, look, we have like a couple new easels. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm 40. So I went to school, you know, like 20 years ago. So this hasn't changed at all. And so here's our very high tech burning, uh, dodging tools. Actually, we didn't have the, uh, we didn't have the magnet before, so they were sort of flying around on the floor. As you guys know, you can't find anything in the dark room. So somebody installed a magnet that you can hang on the wall and actually find the very high-tech tools that we use. Those are our high-tech burning tool, or dodging tools. That's just another view of the, of the very high-tech dark room today. So 20 years, it was, it, was, it was a little bit lower tech. It wasn't red. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that's changed. Literally, like, that sign is the same. All those trays are the same. I mean, look at the tray. If you can see the metal tray, the blue one with the white, I mean, the white one with the blue edges. Like, look at all the stains on the, see that fixers spilling everywhere? It's always been like that. And it works. I'm telling, like, it works. I've taken about maybe five photography classes in my life, and, and most of them were here, and then two of them were at the International Center of Photography which is a big deal, but I learned more at this school. So I kept writing, and at this point, it's like in the early part of my career where you know you're really passionate about photography, you don't have to earn a living yet. You know, I was waitressing, so that, that you know, the money source was taken care of, and, you know, the place where the money got spent was taken care of, which was the dark room, you know. And I was the dark room monitor, and that, and Harold Shapiro, who, I never had any money. I mean, he, I was always the scholarship kid. I always got every scholarship. I was the, um, the darker monitor back then. Uh, you know, now I don't know how things work, but back then, you know, there was the Friday night darker monitor session, and I was the person in charge of that. We were supposed to end at 10 p.m. We would usually leave at 3 or 4 a.m. And so, and, and they all, the whole time they knew that. Harold Shapiro just told me last December when I saw him 20 years later, he's like, I knew this whole time that you were breaking the rules. And, I was fine with that. So, and then Harold Shapiro started asking me to teach photography because I actually failed photography. There was you can't fail in the school because there's no grades because it wasn't even that advanced to give grades or anything like that. Nobody cared about grades. What? Why do grades matter? You know, it was just like do the project. And so we started. And so photo one, I completely. If if I could fail, I would have failed it. But because I didn't understand anything. Like, I didn't, I had f-stops and shutter speed completely in reverse. I didn't get it. Like, because I, I didn't listen to anybody. I just went in there and said, I know how to do everything, and I didn't, and I failed everything. But then I had uh, Harold Shapiro for photo two. I think it was, I think it was Harold, no, it was Terry DeGrado, Terry DeGrati, and somehow she got through to me, and I got it, and it clicked, and all of a sudden I soared, and all of a sudden photography made so much sense to me that they asked me to teach. And I said, why the heck do you want me to teach? I'm younger than everybody else in the school. And they said, because you botched photo one so bad that if you can get this now, then you'd be able to explain it to anybody. So anyway, so then I started teaching. And this was just some of my notes back then. It seemed like, oops, sorry. Right. It seemed like in, I noticed, I was, I was writing about some of my students, and I noticed that, wow, no matter what, people always choose the picture on the end. Like, it doesn't matter if it's the best picture or not. They just pick the picture on the end of the, of the contact sheet. I've no, I don't know why. I, it, 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 you'll see. <laughs> you'll notice now. Anyway, so 
that's sort of like my background of photography. Um, I think you kind of get the point that it, it's really no big deal and I just, I, I blindly like felt my way through like a few classes and sorted it out and meanwhile I'm waitressing. I mean it's, it's again, I can't, I can't stress the no big deal anymore. Uh, then I, when I graduated university, so I was going to photography school at the same time that I was going to university. Because remember I said I didn't like the photography program at my school, so I went to this other place and met Harold Shapiro. So I did both of these things at the same time. And when I graduated university in 93, I was invited by my friend um, Sanait Samuel, who is Ethiopian, to go to Ethiopia with her. And so I did, and I took a bunch of pictures and pretty much... 10% of them actually came out, the other 90% I botched, right, because I still had no idea what I was doing. But this one actually made it. And, and so there's, there's two pictures in the beginning of this, of this slide presentation that really had a massive impact on my life, and, I, and I'm sure because of those pictures got me standing here today. And this is one of them, and this is a kid in Ethiopia, took his picture, and came home and showed the people that I know, my friends and family, these are the pictures that, that came out. Didn't have like, you know, light leaks and streaks all over them. This one came out and they said, and I've told the story a lot, and they said, well, are you sure that you were in Ethiopia because this kid's not starving to death? And I, they really truly didn't believe that I went to Ethiopia because the only image they had of Ethiopians were pictures like this. You know, and this photo is of, uh, by Sebastian Salgado, a little kid starving to death, being weighed in grain scales. And that's all we knew, a lot of people knew. I considered myself in sort of an educated circle. That's all that the people could think of when they heard Ethiopia, much less all the pathetic jokes that you hear, what are you going to eat in Ethiopia? Really sad. And I had been there, you know, I had been there, and here were my pictures, and I thought, wow, you know, I mean, I don't even like to hang out on this picture because that was one instance in one occasion. But this, I just got back from Ethiopia last year. It still looks like this. Yes, people wear winter coats. And yes, people are well fed. And yes, people are smiling. So it was in that moment when some people didn't believe that I had actually gone where I said I went. Even though I got vaccinations and, you know, visas and the whole thing, they thought they were right and that I was wrong. And I thought, wow, you know, how would this conversation have gone? How would it have gone if I didn't have this picture to show them? You know, what, I mean, here's living proof and they're still not believing me. What if I didn't have this picture? And so I realized in that moment that photography was definitely the direction that I was going to head because that, that had a lasting impact on me and it still does today. So this is another picture that uh, I took. This is several years later, I went to India and at this point, I'm still doing plenty of drive-by shootings, whether it's traveling or at home in, at this point in New Haven, Connecticut. And I should get a pointer for this, but this is, a this is my best example of my, this is my trophy drive-by shooting photograph. And I call it that because, that's actually not me, that's me taking a picture, this is a guy named Daniel, um, taking a picture of this little boy with his grandma, I guess it's his grandmother, who knows, standing over there, and this is in India. And I want you to pay very close attention to this empty circle, how there's, there's nobody here explaining to me who's this guy, what's his name, what's going on, what town am I even in, it, like, what language do you even speak? Um, I, we didn't know and we didn't care. We just wanted a picture of the exotic kid, right? So we could go home and be cool. We could be cool and say we went to Ethiopia and we met this, or India or wherever, met this kid and I'm this cool, like, you know, uh, Indiana Jones, right? And here's my proof of being Indiana Jones. Um, what was going on in this picture was that that woman on the upper left was pushing that little boy forward and saying, rupees, rupees, which is Indian money. So she's like saying, basically pushing us towards the, uh, pushing that little guy towards the camera and then asking us to pay. So, I mean, what's really going on here, you know? Look at this kid's face. I mean, he's not happy. He's not smiling. He's not like the banana boy kid, you know. He's, he's, there's something screwed up going on here, and I promise you this happens all the time when we take pictures of strangers. We think it's cool. We think we're telling a story. And meanwhile, there's actually something going on behind their eyes, and it shows in your pictures. So this is a drive-by shooting. 
So this is another kind potentially drive-by shooting. This is now video. Anyone remember this? Rodney King beatings? So this is Rodney King getting beat up by the LA police. So it'd be one thing if George Holliday, the guy who, who filmed this video, took this video and just showed it to his friends and said, oh, look how cool I am, I saw this thing. But the reason this is not a drive-by shooting is because he actually got these pictures to somebody who could actually do something with it, right? It didn't just sit in his living room on his video camera or his video VCR or whatever. He's, he did, who knows how we did it back then? This is pre-internet. Must have made copies, must have found people. He got it out there, and I don't know who remembers this in this room, but it changed the world. It absolutely changed how we see journalism, and this is, in my opinion, this is the birth of citizen journalism right here. It doesn't matter that this is bad, vid look at this. I mean, this is atrocious, and it should have never happened, but it happened. And it doesn't matter that that video is bad quality. It doesn't matter that, you know, he's got all this time code and all this flying everywhere. It doesn't matter that he's far away. It doesn't matter that it's out of, it's out of, or out of focus. The exposure doesn't matter. Absolutely nothing matters except for the fact that it exists and it got to the people who could make, some, make a difference because it exists, right? That, to me, matters way more than a cool picture of some kid where you don't know his name and all you get to do is go home and show people how cool you are. So this is sort of where Salam Garage is born from. So George Holliday is the guy who shot that video, okay? Well, uh, who's George Holliday? If you look up George Holliday on Wikipedia, this is it. He's no big deal, okay? He's just some guy that happened to be somewhere and took this picture. And pretty much the only reason we know him, of him is because of that. The only other person is a bobsledder, right? That happened to share the same name. So that video matters a lot for history. It's bad, it's, it's a poor, it's considered poor quality, but it really makes no difference. You're gonna remember that more than you're gonna remember any of my pictures on the screen. So at this point, I remembered how I felt when I took that drive-by shooting picture in India, where that was that kid and the woman was saying rupees, rupees. I felt like, I felt like a jerk. You know, I just felt like this is so self-serving. This is all about me. This has nothing to do with this kid. I don't know anything about their family at all. And so that had a lasting impact on me, huge. And so uh, when I, at this point, my career had been building and I was starting to shoot for magazines and I was starting to shoot for, um, I was starting to shoot commercially and doing photojournalism. So I was lucky enough to be introduced to an editor down in New York who was the, um, who was an editor for Doctors Without Borders. And I was going to Brazil with my boyfriend at the time. And I just didn't want to go and do more drive-by shootings. I was just like, what, you know, what good is it for me to go walk around and take cool pictures and have a cool exhibition and just be cool? I felt like there was a lot more that I could do. So I hooked up with Doctors Without Borders. And welcome. And um, I was lucky enough to go through, go around. This is a, a favela, which is a another word for a slum in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, and these are women who are uh, at a health post, at a prenatal and a postnatal health post in uh, Rio. And so because I was able to go through a trusted source, I was able to build relationships with this NGO. They trusted me, they knew I was coming. I didn't just like walk around the favela and take pictures. You can't actually, you're not allowed. But you know, I built a relationship. I built, you know, I just built a team. And I went down there and I said, let's, you know, let's work together. Tell me what you guys need pictures of. What's going to actually be useful for your organization to help you tell your story to help these women? And, and that's what I feel is the job of a photographer. So that's what I was able to do. And I was lucky enough to, to get these intimate pictures. Like now I know this is Anna, and I know that that's a picture of her, uh, her when she's a little girl. I know where her mom is. I know where her grandmother is. I can tell you all kinds of stuff about her. And then I was even lucky. And then my career started moving more in that direction. I mean, meanwhile, I am shooting like, you know, guys in suits and stuff like that to earn a living. But I was lucky enough to 
also be teaching photojournalism down in um, Kenya. And this NGO wanted me to come over and take pictures of their NGO. So they called me up and they said, we just want you to come by and take pictures of our NGO because we want to tell the story of the work that we're doing. Uh, and what their focus was, was uh, HIV AIDS and extreme poverty. And I said, I, I will and I won't. Like, yes, I can do it because I'm already here and it makes sense. You don't have the budget to fly somebody. It doesn't make any sense for you to fly somebody from another country. I'm already in Kenya. So I said, yes, I'll do it, but I will not walk up and just take pictures at random. I said, we need to figure out who wants to have their picture taken, who's willing to tell their story, who's comfortable with that, who really understands that the point of these pictures is to get their personal story living with something that's devastating out into the world. I mean, you've got to remember, like, when you're doing photojournalism projects and you're taking pictures of homeless kids in Seattle or whatever, like, these people are actually giving you something. You know, they're really giving you their heart. And to just take that and to not give anything back is ridiculous. And I get that, like, when you do one assignment after the other and you're a professional photojournalist, it's nearly impossible. But every once in a while, share some of yourself with the people that are sharing with you. Tell them about your life. Tell them about your family. Tell them about some of the diseases you maybe ha had to deal with. You're, you're sitting here talking to somebody who's homeless. You know, tell them like me. Tell them you had to leave home because you were brought up in a violent household. Like, share with them. Don't just take from people. So I said, please, you know, find people who are interested in telling their story, who people who realize that the whole goal of taking these pictures is to get their story out there. So this is their personal, this is their life. Are they okay with that? So what they did was, and, and they were sort of not happy about that because it made a lot of work for them. They had to do a lot of pre-production and find people. And, and they actually had to kind of man up a little bit and find people who wanted to tell their story and actually get to know the community that they're serving. Some of the people that uh, were working with me on this project, they had absolutely no idea that Caxton lived across the street and he was 15 years old and, and everybody in his family had died of AIDS. They didn't even know he existed. And there's neighbor. And the only reason, I'm not saying that I'm some kind of anything. All I'm saying is everyone has to get involved. And so this is Caxton, who lived across the street from people who had great jobs, and they had absolutely no idea that he was waking up every day like this. And his brother and his sister are lying behind him. And he, every, he had to sell all his furniture because there was, he was the only one in charge of his entire family. That's his brother, Peter. And this is Millicent, who's a widow who lost her husband and lost her first, or, uh, her latest born baby, was born infected. But she's beautiful, and she's an amazing woman for sharing the story with us. These are all the different people in Rabor. This is in uh, western Kenya on uh, Lake Victoria. So that's Caxton, and he's on the, my book is here, he's on the cover of my book. He's another guy that changed, that absolutely changed the course of my life. Like Caxton, this is back in 04. So, yeah, 04. And Caxton, uh, when you go and work in Kenya, people don't really like to say the word AIDS. It's not like here. They have, they use different words for kubwa something. I forgot what kubwa is big and then the word disease in Swahili. Like, it's not, it's not like us, you know, an, where we can say, there's a lot of stigma wrapped around AIDS, so even just to walk into a community and say, tell me about AIDS and HIV, it's like you're already off-putting everybody because people don't even say those words because it's too, it's too harsh, it's too blunt. So I learned that when I was there, and you just listen to the way people talk about the stuff that you want to hear about and, and, and talk about it in a way that they talk about it, not the way we talk about it. So Caxton Odiambo was that guy in the last picture. And he was, he did something that nobody had expected him to do. And he actually went into detail, his life and what it was like to be an orphan. And not only the day to day, like, yeah, I have to wake up at 5 a.m. and I have to work on the Shamba and I have to make all this money to wash my uniform because if my uniform's dirty, they kick me out of school. So I have to bust my butt to, to make money for soap just so I can be sitting there in school. All right, that's Caxton. So, I mean, that's stuff that he told us. But the other stuff that he told us was he told us what it was like to be 
an orphan. You know, and there's a, this is a screen capture from a video, and you know, if you guys are interested in seeing it, it's on my Vimeo page. But the, um, this is a screen capture, and, and we were shocked. So you can't see it, but you know, there's an interviewer here who's the, the local chief doing trans who speaks English, and he speaks Lua, which is his language. And then, you know, I'm over here. So there's the three people again. You know, there isn't like that empty circle where it's like, I'm just talking to Cax and taking a bunch of pictures of him. I'm actually asking him questions, and somebody's actually translating, right, in an appropriate way, not just like bluntly saying, tell me what it's like to be an AIDS orphan. He's translating in a way that's actually softer to hear, in a way that's appropriate to their culture. So what he did, he did the unexpected, and he talked about what it was like to be an orphan, and he's well aware of the stigma. He's well aware of how people look down on him. He's well aware of how people, because of the stigma attached to AIDS, how people look at, talk about his parents who are now dead. And, and somehow that stigma is now, he feels that it's attached to him. And it's heartbreaking, because he's an innocent kid that's just trying to do what you guys are waking up and trying to do. And this is, this is the sentence that sort of got us all. We had not expected to hear this. Kennedy, who was helping me with this, had not expected to hear this. And he said, I just want to be seen as someone who exists. And the more work I do of this, the more I find that this is how people feel, especially when they're being photographed. Because they know that there's an opportunity to tell us something that's going to tell the rest of the world if we listen. So this is what Caxton was saying. So I didn't promise Caxton verbally through the translator that I promise you you'll be seen as someone who exists. That's, I can't do that. Only he can feel that he exists on this planet. But what I can do is get his story out to you, right? That's, well, that's what I can do, is li like truly listen to what he's saying, take his picture, and get his picture out there. So he, he made it, he's on the cover, you saw him in the poster and everything. Um, and let Caxton's message be a good message to you guys as you're learning how to, learning photography and you're learning how to tell people's story. You really are given, and it sounds like I'm wrapping up the talk, but I'm not, but you really are given a massive gift when somebody lets you take their picture. You're given a gift. And it's, you ha I believe that we have a responsibility to get that story out there to a place that can actually help connect them if they need help, help them get it. Or if they just need, they just need their story to be told. I think that we're, we have that responsibility as storytellers to do that. Not just hang it on our wall, not just put it on our Facebook, not just tell people that we went somewhere and be Indiana Jones. So that, as you can tell, as you can see, had a pretty big impact on my life. So along the way, as I was doing these projects around the world, people were asking me, can I come with you on these trips? And I said, just sort of like how I said to Rebor, uh, the NGO, I said, yes and no. I said, you can come on these trips, but not yet. Because I don't, the last thing I need is like, taking a picture of Caxton or videotaping Caxton and having like a freaking entourage of people listening to this guy like share his heart with us. He's not going, first of all, why would he? And second of all, you couldn't see it because it's not video. His jugular vein was, be was beating, so he was so nervous. He was going way high on a limb telling what it was like to be an orphan. Can you imagine doing that? Like getting up in front of all these people and telling that everyone's taking your picture and writing a note and doing video camera and clicking and tweeting and Facebooking? It's ridiculous. So I said no, but then I thought about it and um, I had gotten more and more requests of this. I started speaking to schools like this a lot and people were saying, well, I really want to have that experience. I want to, you know, you're telling us what you're doing. I want to have that experience too and I'm not seeing opportunities for me to do this. So I created Salam Garage, and what we do is that there's a we now, uh, is we lead groups of people like you to international NGOs. People pay to go on the trips. They go, and it's sort of like a volunteerism business structure. They pay to go on the trips, they come with us, and then they split off into different projects, just the way I did uh, the project with Caxton. People get teamed up with one or two other people and translators, and you get to work with people like that all around the world. Our next trip is in Peru. It's coming up. So that's basically what Salam Garage is. 
And I created it for a couple of reasons. All these people kept asking me, can I come with you? Um, people wanted to have that opportunity. People, um, I noticed social media was coming out. I, le I led the first trip in 07, and I discovered uh, back then it was MySpace. No, 06, it was MySpace. And I thought, all right, there's a lot of ridiculous content on this social media thing, but the, the, what, a powerful, what a powerful tool this is. Because it used to be where I would hang photo exhibitions on a wall and take them down and then have another photo exhibition. It was kind of exhausting. But now with social media, that you can actually get Caxton's story on your now Facebook or on your Twitter or on your blog or whatever. You know, now there's so many, there's like a ton of different kind of platforms. And you can get other people to know his story. And so I thought, wow, we can really utilize social media here. So this is what a Salam Garage trip looks like. And this, sort of, this picture makes me pretty happy. This is India. And so you can see, like, this woman here in the center, she's filling that empty circle. So not only does Eduardo get a chance to talk with this woman, but here's somebody from the NGO that's translating, listening, trusting us, and believing that we're there for the greater good. We're not just there for ourselves. And so that's sort of what a Salam Garage trip looks like. He, Eduardo's just conducting an uh, interview. He's not taking pictures at the moment. Eduardo's uh, leading the Peru trip now. And so we just got back from Ethiopia, and that's Antoinette showing a woman at the Hamlin Fistula Hospital pictures of her family. So rather just like always taking, she's trying to show her a picture of her husband and her family. I think she's, I think she's from Trinidad. Anyway, she's showing the pictures of, of her life. She's sharing that. And there's a translator. You can't see her off, off the, out of the picture, but... And you can actually, you know what I love about this picture? Is the woman that's at the hospital, she's actually really interested. You know, and even if, even if they are or are not understanding exactly what each other is saying, like, she's actually really interested, you know? Like, we go, to, we go to places and we take people's pictures, but they actually really are interested in us, too. You know? I mean, it really makes a difference when you share something with people rather than take some stuff from people. Can't emphasize that enough. It will change your photo shoots. It'll be warmer and more human. And this is a more of what a, this was in uh, Ethiopia. This was a great story. This guy, David, on the left, he came and he had, he had, and so it works with Salam, the way it works with Salam Garage is we have projects that you can choose from in advance and he chose one project, got there, and the project didn't work out. Either the woman wasn't at the hospital, who knows what went on. And so he was sort of pretty upset about it. He's like, oh rats, you know, I was really excited about this. And he walked up and these two women uh, had a fistula surgery that healed and they thought that David was there to take him home because they're white. He's a white, like, American. They're like, well, that's generally who comes to pick us up. Are people, like, missionaries or whatever? And so they just assumed. And she said that to the translator. She said, well, because he's white and he's from the West. So isn't he here to help? And so we kind of laughed about that. He said, no, I'm actually not here for that. I'm here to, you know, whatever he was there to do. But then a light bulb went off in his head. And he thought, okay, well, my original plan didn't work out. So plan B, why don't I take them home? Because what they were doing was waiting for somebody to come pick them up to take them back to their village. They've been gone for months. And the way it works at this hospital is you have to wait for somebody to raise the money to drive the women back to their villages. And there's, it's not like people have email or cell phones. They just they sit and they wait. And they wait and they wait. They, they don't even know when it's going to happen. A fistula, if anyone has more questions about fistula, I can tell you later. But um, so. So they're just waiting to go home. And so David was like, wow, well, I can take you home. And so what he got to do, instead of hanging out of the hospital taking pictures, is he actually hired, and, and he raised the money on the spot using social media in Ethiopia online. He hired a van and got the women, and drove the women all the way home to their village. And he got to witness them being reunited with their family. And the family had no idea when these two women were going to come back either. So it was, it was an amazing story. Um, it changed his life, and he's written about it. It changed all of our lives because it, it showed us what happens when you just let go of your expectations and go with what's happening. Um, so Salam Garage has gotten quite a bit of press. This is something in the Seattle PI when it was in paper, and then that got syndicated uh, to uh, Chicago Tribune. And so we're using... Uh, 
we're using social media now. You can see we've got our Flickr feed. This is just from Jaipur, India. So people are, that go on the trips are uploading pictures and telling stories about the people that they met on their trips and links to the NGOs. People are putting it on Facebook. But they're not only putting it on Facebook, but they're putting stories and what it was like and what are people's names and what are the links to the NGO. And I can guarantee you, for all of you that are studying photography, you're not going to get 615 people to come to your photo exhibition. I hate to break it to you, but you won't. And actually, if it hangs for a month, you're probably not going to get 650 pe 615 people to look at your pictures. But you will with Facebook, and it will get shared, and their story, and Caxton's story, the Caxtons of the world, will get out there, and more people will know they exist. And it's much better, right, than picture of you on the week, over the weekend, like, <laughs> whatever you're putting on Facebook. <laughs> I'm just going to stop there. But I mean, the laughter in the room, you see the point. Like, you guys could be, you know, you could be, pro you could be populating your Facebook or all your social media with stuff that's sort of ridiculous, or you could actually use that opportunity to tell somebody else's story and make a difference, which is what people from Salam Garage have done. This is a curator. This is David uh, Goldman. That's the story that he ended up telling was these women going home. And it's a happy story. It's an awesome story. And I'll tell you something else, is you're also going to have a better chance in this world getting projects out there in galleries and on online galleries when there's stories about somebody other than yourself. Like, if you have feel-good content, people want to show it. When you touch, when you, when you tap into like the greater good or humanity, you will see that your work will, will explode just because that's sort of the way nature works, right? If you're just sitting here talking about yourself and here's me here and here's me there, uh, and, and I don't have any logic behind it, it's more faith-based, but you will absolutely have a better, you will have a more impactful career because everybody wants to do good, you know? So Social Documentary is another website. I mean, this stuff, I can't even give you enough. The work that's gotten out there is really extraordinary. And I don't know if you know Photo District News. They just covered us and covered it. Well, not us, but a story that somebody did in, um, who knows Photo District News? You should. <laughs> you should if you're studying photography. It's sort of like the leading magazine, uh, leading photo industry magazine, and PDN Online. And here's something else that's really cool that's happening with Salam Garage and social media. So there's this, there's this new platform ca called CrowdRise. And so somebody from the NGO, uh, from the Indian NGO called Batsalia, emailed us and said, we're trying to build this school. We have no idea how we're going to do it, but somehow we need to raise $40,000. And so some guy that went on a Salam Garage trip built this. He, he said it took like two hours or something to put this together. And you can see they're like halfway there. I don't even think this site had been up for a week or something like that. But he had the pictures. So instead of just a website that says, we need help, Conrad actually got to take the pictures that he made in India and say, I know these people, and I know that the work that they're doing is good. And I know that it's actually going to help people. I was there. So these are just some things that people are doing with Salam Garage. And the other way, like this is really interesting too, when people go on the trips, has anyone ever heard of Kickstarter in the room? It's another thing you ought to check out. Like if you're trying to raise money to do something, like people that go on Salam Garage trips always successfully raise money to go on a trip using Kickstarter. And the great thing about this is not only do you raise money to do what you're trying to do, you're already building, the, building kind of like this foundation where people are going to see your story. They're going to wonder whatever happened to you that went on that story. And they're going to hear about Caxton, right? Because they actually have a vested interest in it. They're interested in what you're doing. So now we're also having exhibitions. We just had one in Seattle and Fremont. And then what's great is people, you know, people show up and everybody, it's just great. And everybody learns this is Agros, which is an NGO in Guatemala. Another one. We've had a lot. And then the press shows up and people talk. That's Conrad again. And something that's interesting that's happened as a result of Salam Garage, it's like I keep getting asked to speak at these things. And so as much as I can, I try and talk about Caxton. 
This is Web 2.0, and then this TEDx. And now what also is very cool that's happening. Who's any, anyone here ever hear of Blurb? Really? One person? Blurb is super cool. So Blurb is a way that you can publish your book online. It's blurb.com. And you don't have to have a publisher to publish a book anymore. It's th those, those days are over. Like book publishing had a Napster moment, and that's called Blurb, where like all you have to do now is go to Blurb, and there's a couple other ones, but I think Blurb's the best. And you publish your own books using Blurb's platform, and it's called print on demand, so that you don't have to have this big stack of inventory. And not only do you, when the old school way of publishing books is not only do you send out, I don't know how many book proposals, let's say 100 book proposals, and somebody finally publishes your book, then you have to deal with all this inventory. So you, it's not like they order, I don't know, hundreds or thousands or whatever it is at a time. And you have to like put those books somewhere. And so not only do you have to deal with those books, but some people have to rent uh, storage space to put their books in. The publishers don't always hold them. So I have a, friend, I have a couple of friends who publish books the old school way. You go to their house and you like have to move around their books because it's like, I don't know where else to put these. And so that's stuff that people don't think of when they get their book published. But what's great about Blurb is any one of you in this room can publish a book on Blurb, and it's called Print on Demand. And they're actually gorgeous, gorgeous quality. But I've got an a example here. You can publish a book, and then you can just people can down, like pay for them on the internet, and it'll ship straight to you. So all of you can publish books now. You need to check out, you need to check out all of these websites, especially as budding photographers. But here's, so we've, so, we were lucky enough, Blurb sponsored us, and now they make a book out of every one of our trips. This is our most recent one. And once again, like, they're also using social media. So, you know, the, the stories of the NGOs, they end up on the, bl the Blurb website, and then people end up liking it, and then Caxton's story gets out even more. Oh, and that's the end of my talk. <laughs> um, kind of an abrupt ending. It's sort of wanted to show you where Salam Garage is now. Um, we have a trip coming up to Peru, and there's four spots left if anyone's interested. This is the information. Um, and, I, and I really wanted to leave a lot of time right now for question and answer and have it be informal, if that's at all possible, with you guys sitting there and me standing here. But uh, thanks a lot for listening. And, and does, does anyone have any questions or supposed to clap first and then you, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yes? How do we, the question is how do we choose from the people who go on the trips? There's a sign up thing on the website and Salam Garage tends to attract the right person for the trip. Some people don't really get the concept because nobody else is doing this. Um, and there have been a few people that we've talked out of going on the trips because they wanted more of, more of the skim the surface experience. This was a, for one of our India trips. And we just, we just talked them out of it and said, you know, this isn't the right trip. This is, this is the kind of trips where you do uh, what, what I call, or I don't call, but I've borrowed the term deep hanging out. Like you actually go and you spend time with the NGO, at least maybe a third or half of the trip with the NGO. And some people... They ditch the rest of the trip, and they're like, can I just stay here the whole time with the NGO? And it's flexible. So I would say 95% of the time, the people who come to Salam Garage are the right people for a trip. I mean, even the name you know, is off-putting for some people, because Salam is Arabic. So people are already like, what is this Arabic stuff? You know? and so it's, it's not like happy trails. you know. It's more, so either, either off people are like, I don't get that, or that is so interesting that I want to find out more, you know? What? Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so Kickstarter, actually, I can just go back to that slide. Kickstarter is excellent. But kick, here it is. So Kickstarter is a way to, as you can see, she like raised more than she had planned on. Um, 
that's one way to do it. And it, some people, because they're photographers, we, we have kind of like a giveaway, right? We have a picture that we can give people. So what they do is they set it up on their, on their own. You know, if you give this much money, then you get this. If you give this much money, then you get 8 by 10 or whatever, signed or framed. Or, and people choose what they want to give their donors. Um, there's a new one out that uh, haven't, nobody's tried yet. They probably will for our upcoming trips. It's called Emphasis. And the lot, the IS is the extension. So however you spell emphasis is dot IS. That, does that make sense? Like emphasis is. Does that make sense? I can't spell, so I'm, I'm not even going to, I don't want to try. <laughs> but anyway, that's specifically for photo projects. So that's, that's actually just came out like about a month ago or so. And so um, basically, I think it all goes through PayPal. So you just, you just open up a, hopefully, has anyone not heard of PayPal? Should ask that more of that flip side. All right. So you just, you, you create a PayPal account, which is free, and then you connect it to these, these fundraising platforms. And that's how it works. Yes. Well, I'm not, I mean, I don't work for Kickstarter, so I don't know. Mm. I mean, I, I can be a red flag, you know what I mean? Like, in other words, there's, there's plenty of bad stuff happening all over the place. I, I just, you could, these, are things, these are tools that are available. I'm sure there's people out there doing stuff that's ridiculous, but how do I monitor what they're doing? I don't. You know, I just focus on Salam Garage and like that's the thing. But that's, a, I mean, I'm sure it's happening, you know. But we could say that about anything at this point, unfortunately. Yeah. You've got a really good memory. It's true. And somebody, else, somebody gave me that idea a long time ago. I was going to do a project, and somebody said, here's $100. And I was like, thanks. And they said, no, no, you have to give me a print. And I was like, right, you're speaking code. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. They're like, okay, pre-print sales. And I was like, what do you mean? And they said, normally your prints go for 200 300 whatever dollars in a, in a gallery. Here's $100 for an unknown image, but it's going to help you build, you know, your funds to go on the trip. So you get a discount because you don't know what the picture is going to be, so you get kind of a deal, but at the same time, you can raise money doing pre-print sales. You can even do it with digital photography saying, hey, if you guys want to help support me go on a trip, it doesn't have to be Salam Garage, any kind of project you all are doing. I, I'm doing a print, you know, basically we know that it'll be something from Ethiopia. I have no idea what I'm going to come back with, but if you want to help support me and help it help make it happen, I'm going to do a pre-print sale. And I did. I, it was ridiculous. Like, I've had a lot of success with that. Um, you know, I'll be honest. Like, I've taken, you know, 911, I don't know if you guys know 911 Media, which is down in Seattle. Uh, I've taken grant writing classes, and I've gotten a lot of grants, and, I, and I'm lucky enough to get written into grants now. But <laughs> you're better off just asking people for money, honestly. Like, <laughs> It's taking, like, it was so time consuming. And, and the good thing about grants is that you, you get one, right? And it's sort of like a great resume piece, like I got some grants and, you know, I'm so cool. But, you know, if, if the goal is to, is to make the trip happen, I, I've had actually way more success just out and out, like, asking people, you know, and when the project isn't about you, when it's about somebody else or the greater good, people want to help. Like, people actually, not only do they want to help, People are looking for ways to help. Not everybody can do what you guys do with photography. A lot of people really dream about it, but they never actually have the opportunity to do it. So if you're going to actually do something, you're going to be able to tap into the stuff that they wish they could be doing. And that way, everybody can collaborate and be a part of it. Yes? Uh, a rather mundane question. Um, uh, digital or film? Myself? Okay, <laughs> I don't know. 
It's like to be or not to be. Uh, I'm all digital now. I showed a lot of film pictures, but I'm all digital. Um, I don't think I've shot film since, I don't know, 97 or something? No, not 97, 07. Um, Why have you changed? Well, I'm also, I have this commercial career too, right? And so that's what happened with commercial photography. People, there was this, there was this sort of moment where people said, do you shoot digital? It was sort of back in 06 or 07 where my clients, you heard some of who my clients are, they would say, do you shoot digital? And now it's, nobody even asks, like, it's just, so I would say, why the change? I would say that the actual field, the field drove that, the field of photography drove that itself. You know, the technology is there, it's just, it's a done deal. Yes? It does. The question is, do I, do I ever go back? Um, Caxton has a copy of the book. Um, the NGO has uh, dissolved. They've stopped existing, um, so they're not there. So Caxton's going about his life. He's in school. His little sister, unfortunately, uh, was raped when she went to school, and so now she's pregnant and a single mom before the age of 17. So. That's really unfortunate, but the baby's not. The babies are, are a blessing. So that's the story with Irene. Uh, Peter, Peter is probably going to end up being the most like, successful on paper because he didn't have the stress of Caxton. Peter's Caxton's younger brother. You saw on the orange shirt. He, he wants to be an engineer, and, and he said he wants, the first thing he wants to do is learn how to like, fix these huts and just fix everybody's buildings and roofs and, and just fix this and move on and fix other stuff. And Irene wanted to be a fashion designer, which was the first l girl I ever heard say that rather than like a teacher or some like, you know, sort of standard answer. But if I can go back, like Vatsalia, this will be our third trip back to Vatsalia this year. Um, uh, let's see, Ethiopia, we're going to go back. And so one of the things that we do with the NGOs is we're, we're not just looking for a cool NGO. I'm looking for NGOs where we can build long-term relationships. So we can go back, and when we can, and like the next Salam Garage trip that goes to Vatsalia this uh, November, we're going to India, it won't be the same people, but it'll be the same NGO and, and roughly the same kids at the NGO. They rescue kids, uh, homeless kids off the street and put them into this really awesome um, legitimate orphanage. And so we do go back. Do I personally go back to all the projects I've done? I mean, I wish I could. If I can, I do. Some I have, some I haven't, you know. Depends. Yep. The costs of a Salam Garage trip are the roughly about three thousand dollars, thirty-two hundred dollars, which is does not include your airfare. But um, and that is you. That what we did was just mimic the same you know prices of all these other kinds of trips that you can go on. So they're just based on market the market, and so those are the costs. And we're finding that. People who are like, kind of savvy, you know, uh, with Kickstarter and now emphasis, or even just at home grassroots things, they all raise the whole, everything, 100% of it. And beyond, as you can see with this one. This is the truth. This is what she's done here. And each trip varies, and that includes everything your translators, all your everything. Yeah. And ten, uh, the other thing is 10% right off the top goes back to the NGO of every trip. So every trip that we do, we take the first, the top 10% and give it back to the NGO. There's got to be, somebody's got to have more questions. I can feel it. <laughs> Come on. Yes. Oh, thank you. And NGO stands for non-government organization. So, wow, thanks a lot. I should, I should, I, I mean, I've been sitting here saying it a million times. Um, I might as well speak another language. Um, NGO stands for non-government organization. And so 
Doctor, who's heard of Doctors Without Borders? Okay, so that's a very well-known NGO. And so for every massive NGO like that, I would say Red Cross maybe, but I think there may be some government tie-in with Red Cross, but it's sort of that idea. So, for, and I, I, I know a lot of people have heard of the Red Cross. So for every NGO that you've heard of, there's probably at least 2,000 that you haven't. There's t it's, it's basically like a nonprofit, right, in another country. I mean, it's the best analogy I can make. Thanks for asking that question. Yep. So the kinds of people that go on these trips, it's really interesting. At first, it was mostly photographers. They, and it was amateur, more amateurs than professionals. It's becoming professionals because we're getting coverage in things like PDN, the Photo District News, which is sort of like a professional magazine. But of course, you don't have to be a professional to read the magazine. That's ridiculous. But it's really covering the, the field of professional photography. Um, so that's who went on these trips at first, basically because of just who I am. But now, I mean, in Guatemala, we had an 82-year-old woman who was a farmer down in California because the NGO that we worked with um, does farming with indigenous Mayans down in Guatemala. So the range is from, first of all, the age range is from like 18 to, now it's 82, <laughs> just because she was 82, so that's our range. But, um, you know, we had a Bellevue housewife come on a trip, and she's, she, she won't call herself a professional photographer, I think. But she's like a, she, she will call herself a soccer mom, and she's found that she's created a sort of niche for herself, taking pictures of other kids, you know, kids on the soccer team. So she's a small business doing that. You know, and so what she did, which was really interesting, is she went on the trip and took, you know, took pictures and did projects, and went back and wants to present them to her kids in school. I think her kids are like 10-ish. So she's going to give a presentation in conjunction with the Bellevue school system and you know, show the story of what, what, and so she focused a lot on the kids and showed like what the kids' lives are like in Guatemala. That, that was actually really interesting. Yes? This year, how many trips a year? This year we only did two because I did some restructuring. So I, what I did was bring on a team of people to deal with all the travel logistics so that I don't have to do that anymore because that was, that was just overload for me. So we did some restructuring this year and then with that, and I brought on new leaders and I had to deal with a lot of like paperwork. So only two this year and next year, um, actually I just read an email, we're gonna go to Palestine Ecuador, Thailand, and maybe Argentina, and pr maybe two more. But those, those are the ones like pretty much in the bag. They're not on the website yet, but you sneak preview info. It's building. I mean, it's building fast. It's building fast. But thoughtfully, I have to s I say that, but then it, it takes about six months to build a Salam garage trip. Like that's how, remember I said, I remember I said that when I was going to Kenya, I said yes and no. I said yes, I'll do it, but you need to do a lot of pre-production in advance. I based Salam Garage trips on how I approached that trip, which was like, find the people who want to tell their stories. We don't just, obviously you've heard me like, I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but we don't do drive-by shootings on these things. Yes? How many people go on a trip? How many people go on a trip? Uh, we keep the numbers low, so it ranges from, six to max maybe 12. And then if it gets up to 12, we're, we're having a couple leaders at once. But people always break down into small, we, never do people all move in like a big group, ever. Like, never. <laughs> I'm pretty strict about that. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta think of it, you gotta think, like you walk up to Caxton's village with cameras flying around, like as you walk, I mean, you just picture this, like pathetic, like cameras going around your neck, like swinging, and you have all this gear that like could, could support their school fees for like five years, you know? I mean, it's, that's the truth. So like to have a, like a ton of us is ridiculous. I mean, you might as well like have a UFO on the top of your head because it's ridiculous. So we really, really, tread lightly when we're at these NGOs and we really immediately break people down into small groups and, and just get away. <laughs> like go off and do your thing. 
Uh, I saw a couple hands flying. Yes. That's an awesome question. Yes, we post and things change, not drastically. David was a drastic change. Like his, he showed up and his project was not there. <laughs> That's never happened before. And I'll bet you it'll happen again, you know. Um, but we on purpose post the projects that you can choose from. And we try and like make it a variety because people like different kinds of things, you know. Um, but we post the projects on there so that you can, number one, start thinking about it. Because some of the things, I don't know about you guys, but before I go on any kind of trip, I start to research. I want to know where's the country, like, I don't know, Seattle, like, wow, what's the rainfall, you know? <laughs> um, you know, am I going from one rainy place to another? Uh, but also so that you can do something like Kickstarter. You can actually say, this is the project we're doing, or I'm doing. Here's a little blurb about the project. This is, these are my intentions. Here's a link back to the website. Here's a link to the NGO. This is real. This is happening. And that... I'm telling you that will just, you'll be finished. You, you completely raise your funds that way because people can see exactly what you're doing and that it's the truth. And so to, back to your question, like how many, um, I think you were the design teacher in the back. <laughs> you were saying like, how do you know there isn't weird stuff going on? I think this helps, you know, when you say like, here's exactly my sto story. Here's a link to Salam Garage. Here's the organization. You can actually contact them. Here's the NGO, you can contact them if you wish. So it just makes everything more legitimate and honest. So yeah, I mean, those projects are posted far in advance. You can choose them. I know there's more. Yes? We stay, it's, it depends on the location. Uh, I think in Ecuador, they're going to be homestays because they have to be. We're going to go deep into the jungle and deal with a community that's dealt with um, shell oil in the middle of nowhere, Ecuador. Uh, so sometimes there's homestays. I'm kind of like a three-star person. We don't stay at five-star places at all. We stay at just like, I don't know if you guys know what a pension is or like a family-run hotel, those kinds of places that, that the company, the the that, peop that people know of. It's never a shot in the dark because the, the team that I brought on already has those resources set in advance. So I answer, it's a variety. It's a variety. It's an adventure. <laughs> All right. Yes. I, um, it, mostly being 10 people at once. <laughs> I wish that I could be, you know, shooting video and still photos and writing. Thanks for coming. And all this stuff all at once, which is impossible and may never happen, probably not. But um, I, I'm pretty, I've learned to kind of be with, really happy with what is. You know, so if, if all of a sudden my camera breaks, and it does, and I'm, and I'm shooting, then all I can do is write, and that's sort of what I believe is supposed to happen. But I do wish when we're on the trips that we had just a, a huge variety of people and the, of doing various different tools. But, you know, whoever shows up is whoever's supposed to show up, so. Yeah. The trips are from, currently they're from 10 to 14 days, depending. Um, and that includes, like, if you have to fly all the way to India, that's within those four, 12 or 14 days. So we try, and, we, we try and be strategic and, you know, use, let's say, Thanksgiving holiday or use, you know, where people, if they have jobs and, and they're maybe national holidays, or we, we try to use that. And, like, Peru, we do it on purpose because we know that students, you know, have the summer off. And so we sort of think that that's more available for student, university students or college or high school students or whatever, or teachers. So um, that's that. <laughs> As you fly to India, it takes the whole day is shot. I don't know. Who's, anyone here been to India? No? Peru? Oh, you've been to Peru? Cool. Ethiopia? Who here has left the country? Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Who here has gone somewhere 
that is not left. Keep, actually, this, keep your hands raised. I should love for this to get on video. I don't know if you can pan. So for all of you, raise your hands high, because video, who knows what it's going to pick up. There's not light on you. So lower your hand if it was Europe, Canada, or Mexico. OK. So keep your hand really high. So lower your hand if it was what's, what's also pretty standard. Asia depends. So actually, OK, so keep your hand up. Who? All right, now forget that. Now I'm curious. You lower your hands. That's interesting. You guys see that, like, what? That's fascinating to me. Who here has a valid passport? Nice. So you know that that's more than US Congress? Do you know that? It's true. The last statistic, it's, I'm probably wrong, so I'm just going to say that right now, but the last time I read that, it was about 12% of Congress had a, a valid passport, our government. Um, what are some other hand I love these hand raised questions. Oh, go ahead. Uh, salam mean? means peace in Arabic. Thanks for asking that. So, and why is it called Salam Garage, right? So it's called Salam Garage because I went on that, when I went on that Ethiopia trip, there's actually, it's actually I went to Eritrea, which who knows where Eritrea is. Nice. Eritrea is sort of like what you think of as Ethiopia, but all the land on the, on the Red Sea, so that's actually Eritrea. They, uh, I went to Asmara, which is the capital of Eritrea, and they have a garage, there's actually a garage there called Salam Garage. It's actually called Salem Garage. Salem is, also means peace, um, but I've, I got it wrong, and I thought it was Salam Garage. And it, uh, it's just an auto mechanic shop where the taxi drivers fix their cars. That's, that's what it is, and it just stuck with me. Because Salam is peace and a garage is like a workshop. So. I thought I saw, yes. Um, how do we decide where we go? That's an awesome question. So there's no shortage, uh, unfortunately, there's no shortage of NGOs because like the goal of an NGO is to not exist, right? Because um, they're solving problems. So the goal is to solve the problem. But in the meantime, there's no shortage of NGOs. So. First of all, it needs to be an NGO that can have a relationship with us. And that means a couple of things. That means, can they handle a group of people like you, t like 12 of you, on their facility? Like, can they actually handle you guys? Because Americans are a pain in the butt. Like, we are, we're the worst. Like, we need stuff. We need stuff now. And we need a lot of stuff. And we don't care. We're just going to buy it because we're so excited about our exchange rate. Like, we're terrible. Like, we show up with 100 cameras, and we're always in a hurry, and we're always losing stuff. We don't speak any language but English, and it, we're ridiculous. That's a, that's a total generalization, but it's based on some fact. Like, we're really ridiculous. So, you know, a, a lot of us ridiculous. I'm also ridiculous. So showing up being totally ridiculous, they have to be able to deal with that. And what that means is, they can't like not perform surgery on a woman who could die just because we're there. Like that's not allowed, right? So they need to have the capacity for a bunch of ridiculous Americans, you know, asking a lot of questions all the time in camera and pictures and all that. So that's like that's that's key right there. Like, can they handle us? Because we're ridiculous. And so second is, um, do would their people want us to be there? You know, like truly, do you want us to tell your story? And do you know what that means? Like that means we're going to ask questions and we're going to take your picture, take your picture and we're going to, we're going to show it all over the place. Like, are you okay with that? You know, are you okay with that? And, and people, we always ask the wrong questions. We don't know the culture. We're in and out of there. We ask inappropriate questions. We just do. I do, we all do. Like AIDS, I didn't know AIDS, you couldn't say AIDS. I mean, when I was teaching in Kenya, I would say you guys all the time, just because it's a colloquialism. We just say you guys. And some of the girls came up to me after and they said, why don't you ever speak to the girls? You only address the boys. And so for like not two out of nine weeks of teaching there, the girls just thought I was ignoring them. So we're ridiculous and we don't even know how ridiculous we are. So. Are they okay with that? And then they need to have kind of a web presence. It doesn't have to be a great website at all, but just some place that we can go to to see that they're legitimate. And if you're doing something like Kickstarter, 
some place that other people can go to, a phone number, contact information, internet access, because that's how we can communicate, those kinds of things. And we really are looking to build relationships. Like, it, nothing makes me happier than to go back to Vatsalia and see that, those folks again and just see how they're growing. It's so cool. And we're going to see the school that, you know, they're building too. What else? Yeah. Are there collective exhibitions? Well, we have the book. So then, so Blurb makes a book out of every trip. So that's sort of like, kind of like a collective exhibition in a way, right? Um, we, people, they sort of just create their own exhibitions. We just had an exhibition in Fremont. Um, the Indian folks, they put together exhibitions. So they're kind of on their own and they're self-organized, but they always do it. You know, it's not like a mandatory thing, but they can't help but not to do it because truly their lives have changed. You go on one of these, and this is, it sounds really cliche, but it's true. If you go on one of these trips, you will never be the same person. You won't. You will absolutely, you'll meet somebody like Caxton. And, I, and I'll tell you something else. We think we're going there to do some good. Caxton probably had more of an impact on my life than I'll ever have on his life. I am forever grateful for meeting him and feeling so lucky to meet this guy, to share his life. We don't do as much as we think we do, and other people do more. And, and you can only experience that if you, if you try it out. It's, it's, it's just, you'll never be the same. You guys have any other questions? That was kind of an intense ending. All right. <laughs>